Romans chapter 4, verses 18 to 25. Abraham believed and hoped, even when there was no reason for hoping, and so became the father of many nations. Just as the scripture says, your descendants will be as many as the stars. He was then almost 100 years old, but his faith did not weaken when he thought of his body, which was already practically dead, or of the fact that Sarah could not have children. His faith did not leave him, and he did not doubt God's promise. His faith filled him with power, and he gave praise to God. He was absolutely sure that God would be able to do what he had promised. That is why Abraham, through faith, was accepted as righteous by God. The words, he was accepted as righteous, were not written for him alone. They were written also for us, who are to be accepted as righteous, who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from death. Because of our sins, he was given over to die, and he was raised to life in order to put us right with God. Mark chapter 8 verses 31 to 38 He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Some years ago, I was driving around the northwest, no doubt, probably on my way to one of our NWBA churches. And I guess it must have been late April or so, because I remember that as I was driving along, I noticed sort of up on the hills ahead of me, there were three crosses silhouetted on the horizon. And of course, my immediate thought was that probably a group of Christians had been holding some kind of Easter vigil and they'd left them there as a visible witness to those of us who would be driving on the motorway in the valley below as a symbol of their faith. It was a witness to the message of Jesus. And I guess that my reaction in that moment would be pretty much the same as virtually everybody else's. If you see that sign of the cross, if you see the silhouette of three crosses, you immediately associate it with Christianity. And almost anywhere in the world, that is what you would associate the shape of three crosses with. And that, of course, is because the cross is pretty much the universal sign of Christianity. But if you'd been travelling in Britain a couple of thousand years ago, then you may well have seen a few crosses sort of clumped together and uh, dotted on the horizon as you came towards a town. And yes, just like I did on that particular day, your eye would probably be drawn to them and you would have immediately made an association in your mind. But it wouldn't have been Christianity that you thought of, but the Roman Empire. Those crosses were there to tell you who you belonged to. You belonged to Rome. Your country had been invaded by Rome and anyone who argued with Rome or tried to rise up against Rome was likely to find themselves on a cross. 
and very often they would even leave the bodies there to sort of stand there for days or weeks to remind people who had any ideas about standing up against Rome what happened to anyone who challenged this all-powerful empire. This is what you get if you mess with us. You belong to us, you're under our control and you do what we say or else the cross. And of course, that was pretty galling for everyone. And we know in our own country, stories of Boadicea and others who tried to stand against the Romans. But it was particularly galling for the people who lived in and around Jesus. Because the nation that Jesus came from was a nation with a very proud heritage. And while outwardly they may have been told that they belonged to Rome, they, of course, would argue that they were God's people, not the emperor's people. That was where they belonged. They were children of Abraham. Abraham was seen as the father of their nation because that had been God's promise to him. Their very existence was a witness to who God was and to God's faithfulness. So for the average compatriots who lived at the time of Jesus, that was their identity. And that was what you might say was their dilemma. In my heart, I know that I'm a child of Abraham, but I have to live as a subject of Rome. And the cross is that constant reminder to me of this painful and difficult tension. And of course, everyone at the time of Jesus was desperate to see their situation change. And that is why the, the writings of the Old Testament particularly had begun to get so much attention. Because not only did the Old Testament remind them of their true heritage as children of Abraham, but its later books began to speak of a Messiah, someone who would come to the nation's rescue when they became overtaken by their enemies. And of course, the Messiah, in some way or other, would inevitably release them from the oppression of the Roman Empire. Their Messiah would get rid of the cross. And over the years, various freedom fighters had come and gone and they'd raised up their armies and they'd organised their rebellions, but they had always failed. No one could stand against the might of Rome. No one could get rid of the cross. But the people still hung on to the hope that maybe one day they would be rid of the cross and everything that it stood for. And of course... When Jesus came along with his crowds of followers and his miracles and his amazing words and his acts of greatness, people, not surprisingly, began to wonder if he might be this great coming Messiah. And some of those conversations had been buzzing around because in the early part of Mark chapter 8, Jesus had a conversation with his followers about the various ideas and speculations that were circulating. And it was Peter who said in the middle of all of that, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, you're the person that can be the one person everybody believes can get rid of the cross. And Jesus looks at Peter and he says, Peter, you're right, I am the Messiah. And not only that, but you could only have said that if God himself had revealed it to you. So you can imagine how utterly bewildering it must have been after that moment when not only does Peter declare that Jesus is the Messiah, but Jesus looks him in the eye and says, you're right, and God has spoken through you. That Jesus then begins to talk about being handed over to the religious leaders and the religious leaders handing him over to the Romans and he himself ending up on a cross. The Messiah was supposed to get rid of the cross and Jesus was talking about allowing himself to be crucified on the cross and not surprisingly Peter is straight back at him no way that can't be right you can't be the Messiah and go to the cross that's not what Messiahs do and Jesus is pretty strong and pretty firm in his put down I mean he says get behind me Satan when Peter comes out with that statement but not only that Jesus then lifts his voice and addresses not only his disciples, but the whole crowd. And not only does he speak of himself going to the cross, but he says, if anyone would be my disciple, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Now, at one level, that would have made sense because the cross was a denial of yourself. 
It was intended to rob you of your heritage and identity. It was intended to say to those who believe themselves to be the children of Abraham, a chosen nation, the people of God, the subject of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. No, you can't have that identity. The cross says, no, you're not. You're the slave subject of Rome. Whatever ideas you may have about your identity, you're ruled by Caesar. That's your reality. So yeah, deny yourself, take up the cross, kind of made sense. So let me invite you to clock forward again to that drive that I took a few years ago through rural Lancashire, where I could see the cross and immediately saw it and recognised it and associated it as a sign of the Christian faith, a sign that tells me that I am subject of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that I do belong to a holy nation and I'm part of a people who belong to God. It, it doesn't challenge me to deny it. It reminds me that it's true. So what happened? What happened between that moment when Jesus spoke these words? What happened between that moment when people like Peter just stood there in disbelief and said, that doesn't make sense? And the situation that we find ourselves in today, or perhaps more importantly, what does that tell us and what does it tell us about how we should live and can live in our here and now? Well, fortunately, in the early days of the church, there were people like the Apostle Paul around who had an incredible grasp, not only of the religious heritage of the Jewish people, and knew all about what it meant to be a child of Abraham, but also through an amazing encounter on the way to Damascus in Syria, he also knew what it meant to live as a follower of Jesus. And he spent a lot of time trying to connect all these different pieces together. And in quite a few of the books that he wrote in the New Testament, he kind of grapples with three realities. First of all, what does it mean to live in the real world, in the shadow of the cross, in first century Roman Empire, with all the power structures that are apparently stacked against us in that situation? Secondly, what does it mean to live as citizens of God's kingdom, as those who enjoy all those benefits that were associated with being a child of Abraham? And what does it mean to live as a follower of Jesus? And the point that Paul makes is that it's perfectly possible to be all of those things. In fact, says Paul, it's only by living as a follower of Jesus that you can hold these other two realities together. And it's the cross and it's the invitation of Jesus for us to take up our cross that makes sense of it all for us. And that might have something to say to us at a time when we are struggling to make sense of what's happening around us. And at the cross, it does all make sense. And it makes sense because of three things. Because of who Jesus was, because of what Jesus did, and because of what Jesus accomplished through that. So it was actually really important that Peter declared that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. And later, as the early Christians began to get their heads around that, they realised that in the case of Jesus, he was God. Or as the Gospel writer John put it, the word made flesh, God in human form. So what happens when you take God and you nail God to a cross and you allow the body that God is inhabiting to die? Well, first of all, that only happens if God lets it happen. So what happened on the cross wasn't what the Romans or the Jewish leaders did. It was what Jesus did. And that's why it's significant that in these chapters, in these days and months before his crucifixion, Jesus is openly saying this is what is going to happen. Now, what human power would ever dare to treat God in that way? Surely, there can be no greater act of human wickedness than to take this all-powerful, all-loving creator, this God who is the source of life, this God to whom we owe everything and to seek to destroy him. Yes, says Jesus. Yes, says Paul. There is no greater act of human wickedness because, yes, that's what it is. The sum total of all human wickedness. But God's love is so great that even in the midst of that, he can still cry out, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. 
And God's self is so infinite that only he could be sufficient to even make right and make good out of that. And God's power is so great that just as Jesus said, death could not hold him. And he rose again on the third day. And in that moment, the cross didn't stop being the symbol of oppression and human wickedness. It remained Rome's preferred method of violent execution for many decades to come. But in that moment, it also became the symbol of hope, the symbol of love and forgiveness and death being overcome. The cross says to us, yes, this world can be a pretty difficult and a pretty wicked and a pretty daunting place. Yes, at times you may feel overwhelmed by the circumstances that imp are imposed upon you. But God's love is greater. God's power is greater. God's hope is greater. And some years later, when Paul was writing to the church in Rome, he talked about Abraham and he talked about him being the father of this great nation because he was chosen by God. And he talked about how Abraham was a righteous man. And he said to those who, like him, had accepted Jesus' invitation to take up the cross and follow, do you know, we're just like Abraham. Through the cross of Jesus, we have become the children of Abraham. Through the cross, God's promise has become true. And like Abraham at the cross, we are declared righteous. Now, Abraham never lived to see that great nation that his descendants became. He never lived to see God's promise of salvation completely fulfilled. But he believed in it. And he believed in it because he believed in God and he knew that God was faithful. And the cross says to us, you too can believe in this faithful God and the promises of this faithful God. And that invitation of Jesus stands to this day. If anyone would be my disciple, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And in taking up the cross, we don't escape the challenges and the struggles of this world. And in recent months, we've lived in the shadow of death and disease. And we've seen the best of human behavior, but we've also seen some of the worst. But we do so knowing that the Jesus we believe in has also seen the worst of human behavior and has borne the brunt of it and, and stands with us in our struggles. And at the cross, Jesus says, Whatever you face, whatever you suffer, whatever you fear, whatever you are forced to endure, my love is always greater. I have already overcome it and I have even overcome death itself. So that's the first thing that we can perhaps recognise when we hear these words of Jesus. In taking up the cross, we accept that life will bring its challenges. It will require its sacrifices. It might take its toll, but God is with us. Jesus says, follow me. Not, I'm going to leave you an instruction manual of how to deal with it. Not, I'm going to give you a self-help course so that you can cope. Jesus says, I am with you. Following me may well take you into the valleys of shadow, but you will be following me. You will be with me and you will not be facing anything that I haven't gone through before you. And the fact that Jesus says, take up your cross, says to me, the cross is not about Jesus somehow taking the struggle away, but inviting us to acknowledge it but to acknowledge it with the confidence of all that the cross means. So it's an invitation to recognise and to embrace who Jesus is. He's God with us, God at our side. But it's also an invitation to embrace what Jesus did. This is how God demonstrated his love for us, says Paul in another place. He sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice. This is where we encounter the love of God. And this is where, like Abraham, we are declared righteous. We are a forgiven people. Not because forgiveness is cheap and easy, but because at the cross, God was willing to pay the huge price. And it speaks, therefore, of the transforming power of God. 
For just as the cross has been transformed from a symbol of oppression to a symbol of hope, just as at the cross Jesus transformed what seemed to be like defeat into victory, the cross says to us, there is no failing on your part that God cannot forgive. There is no situation that is beyond the pale of God's love. There is no circumstance that God does not have the power to transform. And in the darkest days of the Roman Empire, there was no greater symbol of cruelty and oppression. Yet in the light of what Jesus did, there is no greater symbol of hope. There is no greater example of the transforming power of God. And thirdly, we are invited to take up the cross. We're invited to grasp the consequences of what Jesus did there. Sin is forgiven and righteousness becomes possible. Death is defeated and eternal life can begin. And it is this that puts the struggles of this world into perspective. Because yes, we are facing, many of us are facing some really difficult stuff at the moment. But whatever life might bring our way, at the cross, God declares to us, that our eternity is secure because it is at the cross that Jesus put himself in our place, so to speak, to, to pay the price for the mistakes, the sum total of the mistakes of humanity and open for us the doorway to God's eternal kingdom. And so, yeah, our journey remains a difficult and challenging one. And yes, there are signs of hope, but there is a long way to go yet. But again, perhaps the suffering and the sacrifice that the cross represents might in itself help to put some of those things that we are facing into perspective. But as those who are called to be disciples of Jesus, like every generation of believers before us, all of whom face their own fair share of trials and tribulations, we have this simple but profound invitation that both acknowledges the realities that we face and the hope that will hold us secure. If you would be my disciples, let us deny ourselves, take up the cross and follow Jesus. Mm -hmm.